So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Karina Apostol. I'm a guest lecturer at uh, MA Post at the Latvian Art Academy. Super happy to see so many of you here. So we'll begin with a short introduction and then I'll hand it over to our special guest, uh, artist Oliver Ressler, who we are super excited and proud to have with us uh, in Latvia for the first time. Um, and uh, I just want to say the title of today's lecture, um, Art and Extractivism Between the Movements and the Museum. And um, to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, we are very grateful to the Filias Foundation uh, in Vienna for producing this project with us. Uh, Oliver is here with us this week and uh, after today's open lecture, uh, which is being recorded, uh, he will have a workshop with uh, students at MA Post. And uh, as a result of this workshop, we will uh, create together uh, a publication uh, based on um, the topics being discussed which are around uh, art and the social justice movement and climate justice movement. Um, I met Oliver many years ago uh, online and I followed his practice ever since. I think it's over 12 years now. And uh, together we uh, did an exhibition at the Tallinn Art Hall last year called Barricading the Ice Sheets, which is the result of a multi-year research project that he will be discussing, and um, it resonated with a lot of people in um, Estonia and um, also in the Baltics, so I'm, I'm very happy that we managed to continue this collaboration uh, here. And um, also his uh, visit in Latvia is possible with the support from the uh, Latvian Art Ac Academy of Art and uh, also the Austrian embassy here in uh, Riga. So we're, we're very grateful that um, everybody made this uh, happen today. And uh, of course, I also want to thank all my colleagues at uh, POST uh, who have uh, made this event possible and have been kind of working behind the scenes uh, with everything from setting up this lecture to making posters to helping with the publication and uh, everything. And also we wanted to shortly introduce ourselves. And I just want to give it now to my colleague, Christoph Ansans, who will say just a few words about POST and who we are and what we've been doing. Thank you, Corina, for the intro. So I will tell a little bit about the post uh, really very shortly. So we are MA program cr working cross disciplines. I'm happy to see here uh, co-heads of the program, uh, Amanda Zemele, uh, Kaspars Groschaus, and another person maybe come, will come later, Armand Zelch. And um, so we're working and looking at the uh, ideas of the context, how context can be used as a medium, and we kind of grow around the um, ideas uh, and art which comes from Latvia, then further on in Baltics, East Europe, and collaborate with many institutions. Um, and I can proudly say around the world, uh, in the last two years we have worked with uh, United States, UK, Austria, uh, Baltic states, um, and etc. So I'm very happy that we start today uh, this cycle of the talks uh, because uh, we are planning already the next events and uh, yeah, follow us and the next uh, guest after Oliver will be Jane Sharp in September who is going to talk about the Baltic art in uh, Zimmerli collection, Dutch collection at Rutgers University. Uh, thank you again, Corina, for intro, and I will give the word to you. Thanks. Um, thank you, and I will just very briefly introduce Oliver. He has had uh, many accomplishments, and I personally kind of uh, really uh, admired his practice for many years. As I mentioned, he produces films and installations and exhibitions, and he also curates exhibitions on uh, the social the climate justice movement and uh, forms of um, resistance. Uh, he has made over 40 films uh, up to date and a lot of very impressive research projects. And um, I would just mention he has had um, many important exhibitions 
at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb, at Neue Berliner Kunstverein, at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Bucharest, my home country, um, at uh, Centro Andaluz de Arte Contemporaneo in Seville, and uh, he has participated in more than 400 group exhibitions um, around the world. And um, his most recent uh, long-term research project, Barricading the Ice Sheets, uh, was recently uh, supported by the Austrian Science Fund and um, really focuses on this topic. And I know there's also an upcoming uh, publication, Barricading the Ice Sheets, to which I had a kind of small participation win. And without further ado, I wanna hand it over to Oliver and thank you again for being with us and super happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks Corinna uh, for this nice introduction. Thanks to the entire team of POST for having me here and for all the institutions who made this uh, trip and the talk and the uh, related workshop possible. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, different ways of how to uh, relate as an artist to climate breakdown and here in particular uh, different roles as an artist you can uh, take over in the climate justice movements. Uh, it's more or less an art talk and I will uh, yeah, g g talk about a few examples of my artistic pr practice from the past uh, few years, several of which were also presented in this quite large exhibition Corina and I did together in the Tallinn Art Hall, barricading the ice sheets which brought together several uh, projects I've been uh, working on. So why to focus on climate breakdown and on the climate justice movement? I mean, for me, it was something that uh, I started to focus on at the very beginning uh, when I graduated, after graduating uh, art school more than 25 years ago, uh, that I felt that this is kind of a central uh, theme and I always wanted to focus on what I considered really super important on in my artistic practice. I was also focusing on uh, racism and migration and on uh, how neoliberal capitalism uh, shapes and uh, influences all our, our lives. And finally, over the years, all these different topics and all these different forms also merged with each other, as of course they are all related to each other and there are uh, central uh, connections. So, um, central, I think, is that uh, we have this negotiation process under the framework of the United Nations, these COPs. And probably the most uh, well-known COP is this uh, COP21 in Paris that took place uh, in December 2015. Uh, where then this very often lauded Paris Agreement was uh, negotiated and later on signed by more than 100 uh, members uh, states who, that are members of the United Nations. The problem with these uh, COP uh, agreements is that if we look at the last 30 years and the process of the COP negotiations is almost uh, spanning three decades, we still see a rise in the carbon emissions and not a decrease in the carbon emissions. So therefore, it can be said that it's not so successful as it is. It can be regarded a failure, unfortunately. And um, what else can you do when this um, framework under which the nation states meet in order to tackle uh, the climate crisis uh, is not working. And I think something really central is uh, to focus on and to establish uh, a, rela a relationship with 
the climate justice movements, as I regard them as the central protagonists who are active outside uh, of representative politics, outside of parliaments, and try to create a certain pressure and a certain momentum uh, that uh, enables it also that uh, uh, there might also be a certain shift. Or that maybe certain f forms, uh, certain carbon uh, uh, emitting infrastructure have not been built, for example. So um, I did a cycle of films on events of mass civil disobedience related to the climate justice movement. And the first of these films was carried out uh, in Paris during the COP21, but not uh, in this uh, space where the negotiations took place, but in the space outside of the negotiations. Uh, actually, that was a time that was just a few weeks after this uh, terror attack in this nightclub uh, in Paris, and uh, that was a very uh, specific time because uh, there was a state of exception uh, in France. And uh, this means that actually every form of protest to demonstrate in public space was banned by those in power, which was kind of astonishing because at the same time, while uh, a democratic protests were banned, a large uh, uh, shopping malls could um, stay open, uh, the Christmas market uh, could stay open, and also huge sport events could take place. So you could already see in this decision uh, to uh, ban uh, demonstrations that uh, Macron uh, tried to present himself and his government, his administration, in the position of those who were able to solve the climate crisis. And he didn't want to have uh, critical uh, uh, voices towards this approach uh, he presented to us. So um, here you can see an installation shot of a uh, solo exhibition I had in Bucharest at this EMNAC. Uh, Corina was also referring to, uh, and this was in winter 2016, and this was the first time that uh, two of these films on forms of mass civil disobedience were presented. Uh, in addition to the one I shot at the COP21, uh, there was also one uh, focusing on an event of Ende Gelände uh, in 2016. Ende Gelände is um, a German initiative um, that um, is involved in organizing uh, events where in 2016 4,000 people participated. Uh, they tried to uh, block uh, a large open pit lignite coal mine in the Lausitz, uh, quite close to uh, Cologne. And, um, and they also um, uh, tried to block and blocked the tracks uh, linking the coal mine to a coal-fired power plant where this uh, extracted coal is being burned in order to generate uh, electricity. And there are like one or two of these uh, one or two day long blockades by Ende Gelände usually per year. And uh, these are the events in Europe with the largest mobilization uh, capacity. So we can see here people uh, wear these uh, white overalls. Uh, they uh, wear dust masks and they w wore these masks even years before the pandemic. Uh, so it's this interesting strategy to make yourself as an individual invisible, but to create a visibility at the same time of groups of people who come together uh, and work together 
uh, and uh, yeah, so this is also quite nice images uh, being created when uh, hundreds and thousands of these people uh, float towards a mine or uh, uh, block certain things. So here it's already a three channel video installation, the third channel focusing on the Tzad in France that is uh, can be described as Europe's largest autonomous region that uh, emerged from an occupation uh, uh, that was part of a fight against a new airport for the city of Nantes in France. And uh, this is an occupation that lasted for more than uh, 10 years. It was uh, evicted uh, two or three times by the police but uh, reoccupied afterwards uh, and it still exists still nowadays and it's probably one of the most successful examples that shows that when a few hundred of people uh, have a certain commitment to hinder the building of a new climate destructive infrastructure, they can be successful. And in the meantime, I think three years ago, I think it was shortly before the pandemic started, um, the French state decided not to build this new airport. Of course, they did not uh, say that it is because of the occupations and because of the resistance, but uh, all people involved in it knew that it would be impossible to build this airport if you want to avoid civil war. So here it's already a four-channel video installation. Uh, uh, the, the installation shot is from a solar uh, exhibition I had in the Kunsthaus uh, in Wien and the fourth channel focuses on a blockade of Europe's second largest coal harbor located in Amsterdam uh, where the majority of the imported coal comes from Colombia where it's being extracted under uh, criminal conditions First, uh, the indigenous populations are being evicted, many of them killed if they resist. Then the, uh, the thousand, thousand year old rainforest is being removed and then the oil is being uh, extracted. If you Google um, coal and Colombia, one of the first terms that will pop up is blood coal. And here it's being uh, burned in, uh, in yeah, coal-fired power plants in different uh, European countries. So that's one of the shots of the, of the films. Then I did a second one on a blockade uh, in uh, uh, northern Bohemia in the Czech Republic, which was different to other things I was working on because uh, the majority of people who participated were arrested, uh, including myself, uh, but they did not uh, take away my camera, so I could continue filming while being in the police van. Uh, so this film focuses then primarily on criminalization and on these things of legal uh, legality and illegality. And uh, that's a, a shot from a solo exhibition that was the second solo exhibition I had in the framework of barricading the ice sheets in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb. And that was for the first time that I could present all of the six uh, projections of everything's coming together while everything's falling apart uh, in an installation with, with projections. The sixth uh, film uh, focuses on the Venice climate camp. And um, it was one of the nicest intervention um, uh, it was a blockade of the red carpet where uh, in the Venice Film Festival in the evening uh, the stars like Mick Jagger or uh, Donald Sutherland uh, would walk. Uh, it was an announced blockade. It said that at five the red carpet would be uh, blockaded. 
the only thing was that the blockade did not take place at 5 p.m. as the police probably thought, but at 5 a.m. And there was no police at that time and uh, only two or three security guards. Uh, so for uh, three or four hundred uh, protesters, it was uh, not a big deal to do uh, to, uh, to do this blockade and to keep the red, red carpet for seven or eight hours. And I had information about this uh, event in advance and uh, was running with the camera with the entire group. And um, the uh, charming thing. Uh, of this uh, strictly non-violent uh, activity was that uh, the camera people from the different uh, European and uh, international networks were already there in the morning setting up their equipments for the large event of the film festival in the afternoon. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, as they were already there, they, uh, they were shooting this uh, occupation, the blockade of the red carpet. So at 8 or 9 a.m., uh, this action was on the top news on CNN, BBC, Spiegel TV, and on different uh, international uh, networks, which is usually not the case with uh, the other... Uh, events of mass civil disobedience I document in this uh, cycle. And while I was working on this cycle, I was already attempting something uh, uh, different, uh, which was directly related to it, because it's, I would say, if you are quite informed in this field, I would say from my position, position it's relatively easy to document these, these events. But um, what I was interested to do at the same time is I wanted also to document these assemblies that, uh, uh, that are being, uh, requ that are required and in which these uh, forms of mass civil disobedience are being planned, are being discussed, are being negotiated between different actors, between different delegates of groups, of um, ecological groups and uh, climate justice uh, groups. Uh, and I was asking more or less uh, while I was shooting this cycle, uh, always when I uh, connected to these uh, activists, if they would see a possibility uh, and accept me and let me film in one of these assemblies. And of course, I told them I would guarantee an anonymity of all participants in order to prevent uh, them from being criminalized for this uh, action. Because civil disobedience is very often that you uh, go a step beyond what is being considered legal in, in states and therefore it goes with a certain amount of criminalization uh, hand in hand. So um, f finally, and, and my, my uh, request was rejected. It was rejected over years. And at some point I, uh, I established a connection with uh, climate justice movements in Spain and uh, they told me uh, it might be possible uh, and th they will discuss in their meetings and at some point they told me like in three days uh, you can film and uh, yeah I, I canceled a few other commitments and uh, traveled to Madrid and uh, filmed a four hour long uh, meeting where uh, I think like 15 or 20 delegates from different environmental uh, groups uh, participated and they were discussing without even mentioning this in, in this conversation, uh, they were discussing the blockade of a central uh, street in uh, a city highway in front of the Ministry of Environmental Affairs that would uh, happen a few days afterwards. And uh, yeah, a condition of course to film this assembly was that I have to uh, anonymize uh, the faces there. And we all know what happens 
in TV reports or on TV news how uh, faces are being anonymized. Uh, so you have this pixelation of the faces, right? And for many people, I think, when they see pixelated facial fa uh, faces, uh, they connect it somehow with uh, criminal behavior. But from my point of view, what these people were doing, whatever the state says, this is, has nothing to do uh, with uh, criminal acts. These are absolutely necessary acts that are necessary in order to avoid a, a, a continuation of the climate crisis and climate breakdown. Uh, so I decided for a form, and uh, y you can uh, you can see it here. Uh, not only to pixelate the faces, but to pixelate the entire uh, image. And for those of us who uh, work uh, and, and spend a lot of time in the art space, uh, th this might also create certain relations maybe to pop art aesthetics, which was for sure not the first intention, but I also have nothing against that something like this happens. So there's also a second way of how uh, the anonymization of the people is guaranteed, but I uh, will skip this for now. And the image you can see here uh, is actually from this blockade of this uh, city uh, highway a few days afterwards that lasted for several hours. And uh, yeah, so this film and uh, the others I presented were uh, shown together in this barricading the ice sheets uh, project I have been working on for uh, more than f four years in the, in the meantime. And uh, one aspect of this uh, uh, work is also that I was interested in figuring out uh, about the role of artists and art workers uh, in the climate justice movements. Because uh, just from connecting with the movements and for, from participating in these events of civil disobedience, I realized that there are really many people who have somehow an art background, right? And I felt that this can't be something that's a coincidence, but uh, there must be a particular reason for it. And I... Uh, in uh, two of the films I was doing in the framework of the project, and I also did a conference on that in Graz and the Camera Austria, uh, I was trying to investigate a bit for the reasons of, of that and for the different forms and possibilities of how to involve as an artist or art worker in the climate justice movements. So to really give you uh, this ideas, this would be an own talk, but I'm doing here a workshop and I think this will uh, focus really a lot on the different um, <coughs> possibilities. But um, I think uh, as a kind of a teaser, I would like to show a five minute long excerpt of uh, this film where we see five uh, protagonists of the climate justice movements who come from different generations. Each of them was born in a different decade. They come from different uh, uh, countries, uh, from uh, European countries, uh, a person from uh, an indigenous person from Greenland, a guy from the US, one guy from Nigeria. Um, and they are all artists and central in the movement, but they all have different ways of how they do their artistic production within the movement and ha how they relate it to the movement. And the film is actually about these different ways of how to connect. The artist has to actually let go of their cultural capital to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, all the art schools, and, and I know I was professor in one for too many years, uh, are. Uh, Still, you know, it's all about your cultural capital, your branding, the individual, creative, expressive self. Uh, and, you know, to attack these institutions, you need, you, 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 you know, you, you will be faced with moments where you're going to have to tell them, no, 
uh, actually, this is not right, and they will never re-invite you. Uh, and so few artists have that courage. Partly it's an economic question. Many, many artists have put the center in their practice, uh, politics into the center of, of their art practice to be inside the art institution. But what we want is the opposite way, is to put art in the center of social and political radical transformation. So it's the other, other the opposite mm -hmm. direction. I think, you know, we need so many new forms of resistance. I mean, we're, we are the, the, the toolbox of forms of resistance of, the, of, of our movements is, is so weak. We need to block this oil, oil, oil pipeline. How we, you know, what's the most creative way of doing it? Uh, what's the most creative way of confusing the police? Instead of doing a new new uh, video installation about uh, the melting ice, ice, you know, think about how how you can actually you know uh, uh, disrupt the shell's latest AGM in a most creative, effective way. I think the role of the artist now is is to get involved and embedded in the movement and see the movement as a material. I think we collectively have completely failed all the environmental movements. We have failed for the last 30 years. We have to recognize all the efforts have been done previously, but we know all these facts since 1972, and nothing has been done. So from Extinction Rebellion, we believe it's needed a radical change of tactics, and we believe only disruption and non-violent civil disobedience might work. We need a radical transformation of system in a very, 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 very short time. What you say is absolutely correct. We have to take radical action now. But I wouldn't blame the failure on the on mass movements, environmental just movements. It's been a failure of the system itself and a failure of most people to recognize the fact that uh, this is something that requires everyone's action and that the entire space has been captured by those who are creating the problems, by corporations who have colonized governments across the world, uh, by people who see every challenge as a means of making profit. So climate change is a big business for, for the polluters. All forms of rebellion and revolution have a DNA, and that DNA is made up of two strands, and one strand is disobedience and is resistance as, and in blocking the system, but the other strand has to be in creating other forms of life. And those two strands have to come together, especially mm -hmm. at a very dangerous moment like this, whereas, as Nemo, you say that we're in this moment of co-optation, you know, where you have JP Morgan uh, Bank last week saying, you know, yeah, hey, we're gonna disinvest, you know, the biggest investors in, in oil and gas, you know, it's the greenwash spectacle this year. It's gonna be that, and everyone is gonna try and co-opt, and capital is gonna, is, is clearly now seeing this as a problem and gonna go, okay, new market, what are we gonna do? So I uh, have to speed up a bit. Um, these are all inst installation shots from barricading the ice sheets, uh, sheets of the exhibition at NBK in, in Berlin. Um, I would like to go a bit more into detail in this project. It's calling Reclaiming Abundance, and I carried it out in 2020. And um, it's kind of an attempt uh, to uh, respond to the question I hear very often in talks from an audience uh, that kind of goes in this direction. Well, I mean, that's for sure interesting to focus on resistance, but what should we really do? Uh, I mean, in a concrete way, right? And people insist on something that we could do also in smaller groups or... And uh, 
So um, I, I got an invitation in 2019 from the Kunsthaus Graz, uh, and they were doing an exhibition where they were looking about Versteria, Steiermark, the uh, region where the Kunsthaus Graz is located, um, might end up in 2050. And I uh, decided to respond to this invitation in a way that I established the following scenario. So we are now in a climate crisis and just as, uh, as, an, uh, as an idea, we try now to, uh, do div to, to take something forgiven, which is more or less impossible that it will happen, that from, let's say, next week on, uh, humanity will develop in the right direction, will really focus into decarbonization and climate justice, and uh, how what could happen in 2050, right? So this was kind of the starting moment of, uh, of this project. So I think what's totally clear is even though we do whatever necessary to decarbonize in 2050, we would still have rising temperatures and it would be much warmer than it is nowadays. And these rising temperatures, of course, go hand in hand with even more droughts, even more extreme weather events, even more flooding, even more rising sea levels, even more um, uh, catastrophes on, on different levels. Um, but uh, it, it means also that uh, in, in this particular uh, example, I focus on Styria and I decided on six different infrastructures that uh, are quite central in uh, generating carbon emissions nowadays. So these are more or less also examples of how to decommission these uh, carbon emitting infrastructures and what to replace them through and how. And uh, so this is how it's being installed. So this is just one of the exhibitions uh, I had at the, uh, at the Kunstverein in, in, in Germany, in Mainz. Um, so it consists, each of these examples consists of two elements. Uh, I made a drone shooting of each of these infrastructures and uh, I, in the first, in this legend, I use uh, the element, more or less the photographic work I managed to shoot. And the second uh, image is a kind of a photo montage that uses the same image as the basis but shows uh, the 2050 scenario. Airport in Graz, the largest airport in Graz, the second largest airport in, in Austria. And uh, I think in 2050, we have to reduce flying really a lot. That means uh, a, a country like Austria, 9 million inhabitants, uh, it will be totally sufficient to have one airport. And even that will uh, have to operate with much reduced uh, numbers of, uh, of passengers in, uh, in relation to what they operate today. But this um, uh, airport, actually, we do not need anymore uh, like an operating airport. But we will still use the building because I think one of the central things is uh, also the building uh, causes a lot of carbon emissions. So we have to reuse all existing buildings and uh, change them so they fit uh, towards uh, uh, our changing habits and our changing uh, requirements for for this infrastructure. So, as the climate crisis will continue in 2050, we will also have more and more climate refugees, and this is an area that's being rebuilt uh, in a horizontal manner by climate refugees, where they set up their community gardens. Uh, and um, they uh, built their, uh, their building structures within the airport area and also all the, uh, the, the parking lots they got also uh, removed and are also now green spaces. 
that's um, uh, Austria's uh, largest gas-fired power plant in Mellach, which is south of uh, Graz. And uh, of course, we cannot burn gas in anymore in 2050 because it generates much too much uh, carbon emissions. Um, so my proposal is to build this area back uh, as it looked like 150 or 200 years ago. So I looked at uh, maps from that time that were hand drawn uh, that showed that the river, the Moor, was not regulated at that time, but it was flowing in lots of smaller uh, um, parts there for the area, which had the advantage that it kept the water there locally. Uh, so uh, it was much easier also to, um, to, to plant corn and, and things there. Uh, so it tries to, um, to attempt a kind of a rewilding. But uh, it leaves the power plant there as a monument for fossil capitalism and for the catastrophe of fossil capitalism. So it looks a bit um, uh, fucked up and it's not uh, an active uh, um, power plant anymore. So that's a um, mysterious largest slaughterhouse. Of course, in 2050, we cannot uh, continue with this level of meat consumption anymore that we have nowadays. Um, uh, those of us who will not have become vegan or vegetarian in 2050, uh, a few uh, times per year, it's maybe still possible to, to eat uh, meat. So on this image, you see still here some cows uh, grassing here, but uh, there's not like um, like hundreds of trucks arriving uh, on a weekly basis, bringing cows there and um, bringing then the small portions you find in the supermarket uh, back. Um, as there won't be any meat processing plants anymore in 2050, um, I decided to use this building uh, to change it into a recycling and upcycling facility for household uh, uh, machines, so for washing machines and stoves and refrigerators and freezers. Um, in general, all of them should have a long, uh, much longer uh, uh, time that they can be used. Like nowadays, it's maybe eight or 10 years. This should be 30 or 40 years. But once um, uh, it's being damaged, then at least we should get the raw materials out of it for the recycling uh, or maybe reuse. And this is being done locally here in this building. You see there are no, there are no connecting streets anymore to this building, but on the left-hand side, there is this train track. The train exists already nowadays. It does not even have to, has to be built, but here it's being used also to transport things. And uh, there's a slogan on it. It says, Besetzen Widerstand Produzieren, uh, Occupy, Resist, Produce. It's a slogan from a movement that exists already nowadays. Uh, it's a slogan of worker-controlled factories, factories that managed to kick out the bosses and that continue production in a horizontal manner. In collaboration with the political analyst Dario Azzellini, between 2014 and 2018, I focused on a cycle of films focusing on worker-controlled factories and uh, businesses in Europe. Uh, and 10 years before, we worked on similar um, entities in Latin America. Uh, so uh, decisions are being made here in a democratic manner because very often there's also well, uh, we will lose a lot, like we cannot eat so much meat anymore and we are not allowed to drive with the car and not fly to the south, or to the beach or whatever. But we will also win a lot. We will win, for example, uh, participation in the, in the decision-making processes in the economy, something we don't have nowadays, right? So this is just one of these uh, um, 
of these uh, knots where, where highways meet in, in Bruck and the Moor. Um, that's uh, Magna Steyr, one of uh, its the largest car uh, manufacturing uh, company in, uh, in, in, in Austria. Uh, of course, we want build that we won't uh, build that many cars anymore. Uh, we will still produce a few electric cars, primarily electric vans and electric buses. Um, so you see here on the one hand that we still have the plant. Uh, we have windmills and so solar cells, and we also have glass houses on the on the roof. Uh, but um, and there will still uh, there will be a lot of work related to cars inside of the factory. But the main part of the factory will actually be, be used to recycle and to use all the materials of these millions of cars that in Austria will not be used anymore, but which uh, contain a lot of precious raw materials we do not have to extract anymore from countries uh, usually located in the global south where their uh, areas uh, are being destroyed, but we use the raw materials from the things we have already here in our in our country. And this, uh, it's a bit of a joke for the uh, end because some people might already be depressed from this future outlook. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, a ski flying um, uh, uh, entity and um, well, it does not require such a lot of carbon emissions, even for usually uh, it requires uh, artificial s snow, just because this is located only uh, in 1,200 meter uh, height, and there's not often snow there when you have the, uh, 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 the ski events. Uh, but uh, for sure in 2050 we won't uh, waste energy anymore for the production of ski events. But we are still humans and we enjoy and deserve fun and, uh, and, and joy and, uh, and therefore we have here this summer sled uh, track. Yeah. Um, I wrap it up now. So the last project uh, brings me back to the city in which I'm based, Vienna. Um, for, as for many of us, the pandemic meant that uh, many of my obligations and uh, planned project just came immediately to an end. But luckily, some other things just emerged in front of the city, in front of uh, where I'm living. And that was this uh, Lobau Bleibt movement. Uh, so there was an attempt from uh, the state of Austria to build uh, a new highway uh, going through the city of Vienna. And part of it is an eight kilometer long tunnel underneath of, uh, of the National, National Park uh, Lobau. And connected with it uh, was the so-called uh, so Stadtstraße, uh, City Street, which uh, is more like a connecting highway, connecting with this, uh, with this uh, um, with the street going through the city and there was a lot of resistance against it and among it was the was a five month long blockade of the central construction site for this uh, street and uh, yeah i i spent a bit of time there uh, got to know some of the participants, some people decided to sleep there because it was important to have a certain amount of people there by day and uh, night. 
And finally, I decided to carry out conversations with some of the people involved there, and I did this more or less on a monthly basis. And uh, as a result of this cycle of conversations, I, I carried out, I, I produced a film. And the film, so this site there, um, the occupiers called uh, Wüste, Desert, just because uh, the, the earth was already removed and the small cobblestones you put there first before you put the different layers of asphalt uh, on the street were already there. So it looked a bit like a stone desert. And uh, uh, so th the activist called this desert and my film is titled The Desert Lives, Die Wüste Liebt. Because, um, yeah, I, I think you see there that people are able that when they have a certain uh, wish and a certain expectation uh, means that no climate destructive uh, infrastructure is being built, then people, uh, when they find together and commit to something, then they can stop this, at least for a time. And uh, it, it shows a certain capacity to become active and to uh, hinder uh, states from, from building something. And I was always interested in focusing on something like this. But it also, when I was also there, he, this is a drone shooting from this uh, desert occupation. And I did this drone shooting a few days before it was evicted on uh, February 1, 2022 by the police. Um, and here you can see quite well also this pyramid that became kind of the icon of this uh, resistance and uh, a few wooden houses that were built there because the occupation uh, was during the winter. So there was snow and it was cold and uh, so there was heating in the, in the pyramid and it was uh, quite cozy. Um, I was also asking people while I was there, um, imagine that we keep this occupation not for three, four or five months, but maybe for 10, 20 or 30 years or even longer. So what could it look like? Like this maybe. So uh, you see, some people were saying, well, here was always a forest. We should get again a forest here. Some people were saying this was an area that like 200 years ago was still flooded by the Danube. Even though it is three kilometers away from the Danube, this was still a flooding area in, in spring from the, from the Danube. So we should bring back water to an area where there was always water there naturally. And some people said we should have more communal gardens and we should have uh, a possibility to, to have here some um, meetings and we need some infrastructure where we can set up uh, workshops and uh, talk about of how to uh, organize a democratized, decarbonized uh, society. So that was actually then an image I created uh, that was informed by these wishes and expectations from the people I was talking about. And um, just a few weeks after uh, the, uh, the real uh, desert occupation was evicted, um, I managed to set up this uh, piece consisting on the photo montages uh, in the museum's quarter in Vienna. So here we can see on the left, for example, the uh, Leopold Museum with the Klimt and Schiele and Kokoschkas. And in the back, we have the MUMOK, the Museum of uh, Modern Art in, in Vienna. So uh, we brought this back in the center of the city and to uh, focus also on the potential uh, and necessity to resist and to self-organize. And this uh, object was also being used by the movement uh, in the two month, months while it was there as a central meeting place. So the movement, the 
uh, developed two newspapers. You can see uh, people are carrying the newspapers or the, uh, the poster announcing the newspapers. These are newspapers that were distributed as direct mailings to uh, 50 or 60,000 houses. Uh, and uh, the first uh, presentation was actually in front of this uh, object. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>